clarifies is we've been streaming these plenary sessions and other parts of the forum live on the internet. So this morning, I also want to reach out to the thousands of people potentially who are streaming live with us on the internet. I hope you have found this to be uh, equally worthwhile and that we look forward to seeing you next year in Pasadena, perhaps in person, because I think uh, as streaming, as valuable as streaming is, I think it's even more interesting and important to be here live. And the reason I say that is so much comes out of the direct interactions we have together. Increased knowledge, shared ideas, new friendships and partnerships, and the furthering of the spirit of exploration, wonder, and enterprise that continually pushes us forward. The, the energy that's been here in San Diego has been amazing. Uh, we've had so many terrific sessions, plenary sessions, technical paper sessions, et cetera, uh, that it's been a very exciting time for me and, and many of you. I hope to see you back here at 12.30 for the awards luncheon. We will be recognizing seven individuals and teams for technical excellence. Now for me, this is one of the highlights of the forum because I think there's nothing more important that we do than recognize technical excellence. These awards are selected by peers, uh, typically by the technical committees that we have here at the Institute, and it should be a terrific lunch and it'd be fantastic to recognize all of these uh, high achieving, uh, excellent performers. Well, this was a very busy week. We had more than 350 technical papers presented in 102 technical sessions across 12 technical tracks. For me, one of the challenging parts of going to the space forum is where do I go? There's so many interesting things going on at once, uh, but you can't go wrong because every single session that I've been in has been absolutely uh, interesting and amazing. Well, I'd like to take this last opportunity to thank all of the volunteers who've served on the Executive, Steer Executive Steering Committee with me, uh, the Forum Organizing Committee with me as well, and, and the other key committees like the Technical Program Committee. Uh, will you all please stand, those of you who are on those committees, and we're going to give you one last round of applause uh, for your many contributions. Really, this conference wouldn't, wouldn't occur without the, the work of literally hundreds of dedicated volunteers. So as we begin to end our time here, we should reflect that this Space 2014 has brought people together from all parts of the international space enterprise, from government, industry, academia. Uh, our discussions on mission-critical topics have been timely and relevant to aerospace and astronautics and I think will lead to further innovation, uh, both in missions, science, and engineering. I'm also confident that uh, the Space 2014 and other AIAA uh, forums in general uh, connect the next generation of aerospace uh, astronautics professionals uh, with the foremost researchers. Uh, we had an astronauts panel yesterday that was just absolutely amazing. Uh, there's nothing like hearing good, you know, astronaut stories to uh, get people excited about space. The connections we've all made amongst ourselves, I think, will, will, will live with us for some time. Well, I also want to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for one last time. Uh, the volunteers make it all happen, but frankly, without uh, the sponsorship of, of a variety of companies that I'm going to list here in a moment, and you see them listed behind me, uh, we wouldn't be able to put on uh, this kind of a conference. So let me, let me uh, uh, give special recognition to our premier sponsor, Lockheed Martin Corporation, uh, as well as our additional sponsors, AI Solutions, Bastion Technologies, the Boeing Company, Crean Associates Aerospace Consultants, Dunmore Corporation, Space Systems Loral, and United Launch Alliance. I should also mention our media sponsors, Space News and Aerospace America. Let's give them a round of applause as well. Well, without further ado, it's now time for our final plenary panel uh, of, of the Space 2014 Forum. And there's nothing more appropriate, I think, there's no better way, really, for, uh, to end this, this set of plenary panels than to have one that really does look at enhancing uh, humanity. The title of this panel is From Earth Dependent to Mars Ready, and it really is a perfect connection with, with one of our three themes, which is enhancing the human experience. 
Please welcome the panel's co-moderators, Greg Williams, who's Deputy Associate Administrator for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters, and Jeff Shehai, who is the Senior Technical Officer for Space Technology, also at NASA Headquarters. Good morning, and thank you for uh, inviting us to be here to speak at this plenary about our uh, journey to Mars, in which you are all uh, engaged in one way or another. Uh, and thank you for uh, getting up and being here for the first session of the, uh, of the morning as well. We're, we're privileged to be here. I am looking for my controller. I have a... Okay. I would just say next chart. Pardon me? Say next chart. And see. Okay, I'll have you guys uh, flip the slides then since I don't have it here. Uh, we're glad to get to be here to talk about our, oh, here we go. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. To talk about our uh, journey to Mars in which we are all engaged. The uh, title for this session is, uh, as you saw, From Earth Reliant to Mars Ready. And that's what you're going to hear about this morning. You're going to hear about the, the challenges of moving from one phase to another, from an Earth-reliant phase in which we're a matter of a minute or a couple hours to be able to return home if we uh, get into a, a challenge, uh, to the Mars-ready environment in which we're going to be as much as, uh, as a year or two for being able to, uh, to return home. In between, we have this proving ground of cislunar space uh, in which we can return if we need to in a matter of uh, days or a, a week or, or a week and a half. Uh, and in that environment, we can test out the systems and the capabilities that we're going to need for the long journey and the long stay at Mars. And so we're uh, pleased to be able to talk about that um, uh, this morning. I wanted to talk a little bit because the theme of this, uh, uh, of this conference is the, the, the connecting and the... Uh, uh, yeah. It, it, the, the connections that we need to make as a, as a global community to be able to, uh, uh, to function and build a better society, and space exploration provides a means to do that. You saw yesterday Earth observation and how that obviously uh, connects us and builds a global, uh, better global society. You saw yesterday uh, some brilliant work in astronomy and astrophysics, particularly the Pickering Lecture last night. Uh, the wonder of the universe around us connects uh, and builds a better global society. And we believe that the human exploration of space does likewise. It's an endeavor around which we can all uh, rally and engage uh, people in the public sector, the private sector, the young, the old, uh, citizens from uh, nations around the world uh, are inherently excited about the journey of, uh, of exploration. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, uh, say a little bit about the, the, the kinds of, of connections that we need to build in order to do that. Uh, the first is within NASA. Uh, that's actually harder than you might think. Uh, but I've seen in the last six or eight months or a year a tighter connection between human exploration, science mission directorate, the technology directorate, and even aeronautics uh, is, is uh, in there as well, pulling together toward this long journey to Mars. Uh, and it's been uh, something you're going to hear about as we go through the morning. Uh, and then there is the connection that we make with uh, the private sector. Uh, the commercial world, as you know, and as you're a part of, uh, is growing ever steadily in their capability to operate in space, and you heard some of that uh, in various sessions this week. You're going to hear this morning about some of the creative ways in which we are engaging the private sector uh, through innovative means and innovative uh, uh, mechanisms through which we can have a public and private partnership in the exploration of space. Uh, and then you'll see a, a hint in here of the international collaboration that uh, we are engaged on in this journey to Mars in the form of ESA's participation in the Orion program. Uh, in other forums that you have probably attended or have heard about this year, uh, you could hear about the Global Exploration Roadmap, that 13 or 14 nations and their space agencies are coming together 
to establish and identify their common interests and interests of participation in this long journey uh, to Mars. And so ours is, a, uh, is an exercise in achieving alignment among a variety of, of players in order to undertake this grand endeavor of, of pioneering space. As you can imagine, uh, and as you're a part of, there are a variety of capabilities and destinations along the way in this uh, journey to Mars. And I'm gonna use this chart really as a means to introduce my uh, uh, fellow uh, panel members and my co-moderator. Uh, it starts off, as you can imagine, this Earth-reliant phase with the space station program. Uh, space station has been continuously occupied for over uh, 13 years now. Uh, and we're really now getting the full, beginning to get the full use out of this the space station as we've transitioned from the assembly phase to the utilization phase. Uh, Mr. Sam Shimini here is the director of our International Space Station Program. Uh, to Sam, we owe a considerable debt. It was his efforts uh, in orchestrating the arguments around the extension of space station into the, at least 2024 that is really gonna enable us to accomplish much of the work we need to do to uh, move into uh, the solar system beyond. And then Mr. Bill Hill, uh, is gonna to talk to you about SLS and Orion. Uh, SLS and Orion are the capabilities that are gonna carry us into the proving ground of cislunar space uh, and eventually to Mars. Uh, Bill recently took over from Dan Dumbacher as the director of the uh, Exploration Systems Development uh, Program. And as we move from the design phase into the development phase, where we're really gonna be requiring programmatic uh, discipline and uh, an orchestration, I can think of no better person to do that than, uh, than Bill Hill. Then as, as we venture into this proving ground of cislunar space, our first foray is really gonna be the uh, asteroid redirect mission, uh, which you are gonna hear about uh, this morning. Dr. Michelle Gates is the program director for the asteroid redirect mission, and she is leading the, a multi-center, multi-directorate effort to lend definition to that program. And she may even tell you about uh, uh, the week she's had where uh, she spent a lot of time up on Capitol Hill talking with them about how this mission uh, is essential on our long-term journey to Mars. And then Mr. Jason Crusan runs our, our Ex Advanced Exploration Systems Division, uh, and you're gonna hear from him about a lot of the, not only the advanced technologies and, and approaches we're taking to Mars, but also what we've called the Evolvable Mars Campaign, in which we are slowly, steadily developing the capabilities uh, that we're gonna need to get to Mars. You will also hear from him about a number of the innovative uh, partnerships that we have with the commercial sector in order to uh, achieve that end. Uh, and then finally, my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Jeff Shihai from the Space Technology Mission Directorate will, uh, will wrap up our session and tell you about some of the exciting things we're doing in a, as a partnership between human exploration and technology, uh, especially in the recent selection of the payloads for the Mars 2020 mission. Uh, so with that, we'll uh, begin our sessions and we'll start with Mr. Sam Shamimi on Space Station. All right, thank you, Greg. Uh, I've been here now for, I guess, three days now, listening to uh, the conferences and all the panels, and I've been really encouraged to hear all the, uh, the robust discussion about Space Station and its role in exploration and also the development of the commercial market. So I'm gonna talk on both of those here this morning. I mean, right? There we go. So, uh, I wanted to give a context for what we're doing on Space Station. Um, NASA and, and the nation's goals on, on Space Station are fourfold. Uh, first is to enable uh, long duration human spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit. And I'll talk quite a bit about that. Uh, next is to enable the commercial market in LEO, and I'll talk about how they're connected. Also to advance benefits to humanity through research in, in biology, medicine, Earth and space science, astrophysics. Uh, to benefit people here on Earth. And, and last but not least is to provide the basis for international cooperation uh, with our international partners for exploration. So I wanna talk uh, first about uh, where we are today. Uh, Greg mentioned uh, that the space station recently was uh, extended by the administration and NASA to at least 2024. It gives us at least 10 years to do the research and technology development to get humans beyond low Earth orbit. It also gives us 10 years to develop the commercial demand and the commercial so, uh, 
supply in low Earth orbit as well, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, we're in the depths right now preparing for the one-year crew in increment uh, with our Russian partners. Uh, we're developing all the research objectives, the tools, the training, and all that, and I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. We're about to begin our, our demonstration objectives for rodent research, which, ha which has a large uh, implication for, for medicine development and, and, uh, and biology research. Uh, and, I'll talk, and that's about to be launched on SpaceX 4 coming up in September. We're also launching our first set of Earth science missions on space station, uh, which is very exciting for our science mission directorate uh, colleagues. Uh, CASIS, the, uh, the organization that NASA's partnered with to develop the non-NASA use of space station, they've been very aggressive in, in reaching out to non-NASA users uh, to develop the commercial use and, and academic use and other government agencies use of space station. And last but not least, our commercial partners that provide cargo to the space station, SpaceX and Orbital, have delivered approximately 16,000 pounds of cargo, of critical cargo, uh, of crew supplies, uh, logistics, um, research hardware and equipment uh, to the space station. And we've had so far seven successful flights to date. Uh, you're not supposed to read this chart, just to show you from an operational standpoint, we're busy on station. Uh, if you look at the, the top part of this chart is our crew rotations. Uh, the center part uh, demonstrates how we utilize all the ports on space station, all the EVAs that we do. And on the bottom part of the chart uh, highlights all the flights to and from space station. So uh, from an operational standpoint, we're always busy on space station. There's always something happening. Uh, on the ISS, plus the research. Um, want to go back, come back to this and, for, and talk a little bit about how this relates to space station. You look on the uh, left side of this chart on the uh, Earth Reliant part and see space station. And what's important here, and if I, if I had a pointer I could show you, but uh, the, the, dur the duration in, in crew time, six months to a year in Earth Reliant, is a long way away from Earth dependent or Mars ready, uh, where we have trips that are two to three years. So we have a large gap in between the, the human side of getting from low Earth orbit to, to Mars. And I'll explain that a little bit on how, on station and what that means uh, to the program. So from Earth Reliant, today we're basically car camping in space. We're only, we're less than two days transit time to get there and back. We have near real-time communications. We have regular crew exchanges. We are crew supplies and logistics are, are regularly brought up to space station. We have atmospheric samples and our crew blood and urine and water and air samples that come back to the ground for analysis. We have modified hardware that, come, that comes up after something has failed. And we have a convenient way of getting rid of, rid of trash. Going to Mars, we got none of that. It's a completely independent life to, to go to Mars. So we have none of those connections anymore, no resupply, uh, no crew exchanges, uh, no convenient way to get rid of trash. Uh, also, our communication time is no longer uh, near instantaneous. Can it can take up to 42 minutes round trip for communicating. So you're basically sending emails and text messages back, back to the Earth. So that's a whole new way of looking at operations. So what's happening on ISS to fill this gap between where we are today and getting to Mars? Well, the first thing we're doing is doing the human research that's necessary to develop the countermeasures uh, to stay in space you know, for up to three years. This particular picture, uh, a couple of, of the astronaut crew are doing uh, uh, analysis on the intracranial uh, 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 eye pressure. Uh, we, we found that, that the, the eye pressure uh, increases in many of our astronauts, and we're trying to understand why is that happening and to develop countermeasures for it. This is uh, another chart you're not meant to read. These are the uh, HRP uh, path to risk reduction. So this highlights all the risks that the, our human research program keeps track of. And you look towards where all the red bars are, that means the risk is uncontrolled. And the green basically means it is controlled and the yellow is partial. So you see, 
if you can read the, where 2024 is, which is about three quarters of the way across the chart, you see that we still have risks still uh, open in the 2024 timeframe. So uh, we'll have to understand when we get to that point whether we need to extend station or live with the risk or live with the countermeasures we have uh, to date. I want to touch a little bit next on one-year crew. Um, just want to highlight some of the objectives. Uh, basically, all our crews have been uh, uh, six months in, in duration. We do not know if the bone loss mitigation techniques we have, uh, the muscle strength mitigation actually uh, continues to perform beyond six months. So that's one of the major objectives is to learn can these countermeasures still work after uh, up to a year. Um, also, we talked about the uh, uh, intracranial pressure. We'll see if that gets better or worse on, on a year-long mission. Uh, and all the other um, behavioral health and performance trends uh, that are of concern for long duration missions. Uh, next, another big uh, area where we're doing work on, on space station is demonstrating the life support and monitoring systems that'll take us to Mars. Uh, this particular picture is our uh, not so simple uh, carbon dioxide removal system. Uh, it's quite problematic to us. It, it requires a lot of maintenance and repair, and things, a system like this is, we're trying to learn how, what fails, what works on space station, so we can build the next system that will take us to Mars. So there's a lot of learning curve that we have to do. If you look at this, uh, human spaceflight is down to all these valves and, pot and tubing and pumps and all that. So we're doing research and technology demonstrations at that level. It's not just the systems as a whole, but things as simple as, as valves and pumps and, and the like. We're also learning how to break all those other bonds we talked about on space station. Uh, the logistics, the crew health monitoring, uh, all the samples come back down to the earth. When we go to Mars, we're not able to do that. Uh, ground. Uh, to crew communications, doing simulations uh, to simulate uh, delay. And you, again, you see here, uh, after a, uh, I believe one of the uh, cargo missions has supplied the space station, this is a node two, and you look behind Katie and it's just packed full of stuff. And that's the kind of things we'll have to deal with when we go to Mars. She's looking for her clothes, is what she's doing. <laughs> We're also demonstrating all the related technologies uh, that are also needed to go to Mars, uh, things that are you know, a little bit more mundane but critical to mission operations, things like the NASA docking system where we'll fly the uh, passive side to station next year. Uh, uh, Jason will talk a little bit more about the AES activities we got for the trash compactor. Uh, we've also got the BEAM uh, Bigelow module that will demonstrate the uh, uh, technology on habitation structures. We've also got our various other systems, rendezvous sensors, leak detection, refueling. Uh, also, we're right now considering what portions of an, of an exploration EVA system we could demonstrate on station as well. So we've got a lot going on that's uh, currently planned or actually uh, being, being flowed in, in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, next, I want to talk uh, real quick about uh, the connection between deep space and the commercial market in LEO. Many of the same systems that are needed to go to Mars are the same systems and capabilities needed uh, to, to maintain human presence in low Earth orbit. It's the kind of things you think about. It's the habitation structures. It's all the things that keep the astronauts alive and healthy, the ECLIS systems, the waste management system, all the atmospheric monitoring. Same thing with the crew health and performance equipment, exercise equipment, the medical examination equipment. Uh, possibly also the EVA support systems. Many of those systems could be the same. Uh, spacecraft systems, as well as the avionics and the like. And, and cargo resupply, if we are able to have a, a, a man-tended outpost in, in the vicinity of the moon, being able to resupply not only uh, that, that system, but also the commercial uh, platform in low Earth orbit. Uh, I want to wrap this up real quick. Um, we, uh, released an RFI over the summer, and we've got responses back uh, in end of June. And this RFI 
uh, for the commercialization of low Earth orbit using the space station. Our intent is to, under is to help us plan the next steps uh, beyond the life of space station. How do we transition out of utilizing space station, not only for government use, for, but for commercial use, into a completely commercial uh, low Earth orbit uh, plat platform? Uh, and uh, we'll be doing, we're doing some planning right now to understand what our next steps and doing and, and trying to figure out that transition. We don't want to have a, an abrupt end of space station and then have nothing to follow. That'll be detrimental to not only NASA's missions, but the development of the commercial market in Leo. I think that's it for me. Good job. Good job. Good morning. I'm Bill Hill. I do exploration systems. Let's see. Move it along right here. We're building a bold new mission uh, designed uh, to design and build capabilities to extend human ex existence into deep space, into our universe. Let's see. So I have to hold. I want to talk through our three programs, Orion uh, Space Launch System and the Ground Systems Development and Operations. Orion is the first spacecraft in history to be capable of taking humans to multiple destinations in deep space. This is a picture of a recovery operation that we did over the weekend um, off the coast of California here. Um, and I'll get to the exploration flight test one that we're gonna do later this year. But the recovery operations, one of the concepts is to use, a, uh, use the Navy and, and what they call their well deck ships and, uh, and bring, bring Orion into it. Um, this was a, uh, a test, like I said, over the weekend that we've been doing. Orion's basically uh, um, a Apollo-like capsule, although it's tw five meters in diameter, much bigger than Apollo. We have a launch abort system um, that's very capable of pulling Orion off uh, the stack on the way uphill, anywhere from the pad till uh, well into uh, second stage. Um, the service module uh, is, a, is a European, <clears throat> excuse me, a European service module. We've made a, uh, an agreement with the Europeans to help offset some of the, their obligations uh, with the International Space Station. Um, so they're building the first, first one for us for Exploration Mission 1 sometime in FY 2018. <coughs> Just some accomplishments. Um, we're getting very close. This is the uh, EFT-1 uh, crew module. Uh, on the on the left is the uh, wait and CG operations before we uh, took it to made it to what we're using as a uh, inert uh, service module for this flight test, and uh, that's just shown there on both sides. Um, here we're just incrementally showing you uh, different areas, the crew module, getting ready to be made into the service module. Um, the service module, again, it's an inert service module with no uh, propellant capabilities, but we are gonna test the, uh, uh, the we have three um, panels on it. We're gonna test the jettison and separation of that. Um, the the uh, launch abort system there on the right at the top, coming, about, coming around, uh, Clockwise, the, uh, um, the Delta cryogenic second stage we're using for our, uh, for our upper stage for EFT-1, and then the uh, actual uh, mating of the command module to the uh, heat shield. Exploration, uh, exploration flight test one we'll, we'll do in December of this year. Um, the intent here is to uh, throw Orion out as far as we can. Uh, we're going out about 3,600 miles, throw it out there to uh, try to replicate some of the uh, lunar reentry uh, heating capabilities. Um, so we'll launch from Kennedy. We're launching on a Delta IV Heavy, again with the uh, Delta uh, cryogenic second stage and the uh, Orion capsule with the, uh, it's an inert, uh, uh, launch abort system. We are testing out the separation uh, capability of that for this test. And, uh, and so that's the primary stuff we're gonna do there. Uh, we'll do 
a couple of uh, orbits and then land back off the coast, uh, not too far south from here, off the coast of, uh, of Baja. Um, so our, our goal here again is to test the heat shield. We wanna test separation events and make sure they're working. And then we're also testing some of the recovery capability as well as the command and control. Uh, Lockheed Martin or Orion, uh, um, our Orion contractor it has responsibility for this. They have worked with the United Launch Alliance to acquire the uh, launch vehicle and they're responsible for the integration of, of this pre-launch. Um, ground systems development uh, is, is working the recovery operations uh, kind of as a subcontractor to Lockheed Martin and our mission operations director at, in, at the Johnson Space Center is also doing mission operations. They can do commanding and, and some level of control uh, for, the, for the flight. So we're testing out a few things on this. And again, it's a flight test that will be launched in, uh, in December of this year. Our space launch system is our uh, very large capability. Um, we're, we're doing this in three steps. First, with a 70 metric ton capability that will migrate into a, uh, about 105 to 120 metric ton capability. We're gonna add a exploration upper stage uh, hopefully by uh, Exploration Mission 2 in 2021, and that'll give us a capability to, to do both crew and cargo, initially with a five meter uh, fairing. Uh, the 130 metric ton, which we'll need for Mars campaigns, um, we'll either use a, uh, a 8.4 meter uh, fairing or a 10 meter fairing as illustrated here on this. And as you can see, you have fairly significant uh, amount of mass lift capability as well as volume. Um, and we're also working with uh, various government agencies and the science community to see if we can extend uh, the utility of the space launch system to those activities as well. This is just showing you some of the th accomplishments we're doing. SLS is the rocket launch systems capable of transporting humans, habitats, and support systems directly into deep space. Uh, upper left there is a, uh, is a dome uh, for one of our tanks. It's a qualification dome. Um, for SLS, unlike the external tank, uh, we're doing all friction, friction stir welding, uh, including the domes, which is the first time we've ever done that. Um, and, uh, and we're progressing with pathfinders and qual units right now at uh, the Machute Assembly Facility in New Orleans. Uh, the larger photo on the, uh, on the right is an acoustic test that we just completed. Um, we found some interesting things about uh, the acoustic noise that were uh, bouncing off the uh, launch pad and we're having to make some adjustments there. The lower left is an uh, illustration of our, uh, weld, our vertical assembly center welder. Uh, this will be the largest weld fixture in the world, probably in the universe. Um, but that's being assembled now, and it'll be about 200 feet tall. And again, up, upper left there, it shows that vertical uh, assembly center. It's kind of askew there because of the wide angle we needed to, to work with that. Uh, the center, up, up, upper center is a, uh, our test stand at Stennis Space Center. It's a B2, and we're gonna do a full up core stage uh, green run on that uh, in 2016. That particular test stand hasn't been used for a while and you can see toward the right of the illustration there, there's some structure on the top and we'll double or triple the height of that to get the uh, core stage in. Uh, again, we're in the process of doing pathfinders uh, for the uh, core stage and, uh, and uh, showing there the, the gore panel assembly um, avionics preparation. And we just recently completed a test of the booster forward skirt. We tested the failure. We wanted to see what capability we had and we're well above a 1.6 factor of safety there. Ground systems development and operations. Uh, we're modernizing Kennedy Spaceport with uh, the capabilities to launch spacecraft built and designed by both NASA and the private industry. We're building a multi-use uh, capability here. 
Uh, we're leveraging the uh, mobile launcher that was built for Constellation, making modifications there. Uh, the illustration on the right shows the uh, high bay three in the ver vertical assembly building. And uh, we're putting in uh, platforms that are extendable and, and can be moved vertically as well. So we can adjust for various uh, launch vehicles or various capabilities that we might be able to use there. And we're doing an insert design where uh, the platforms will come to a certain place and then we'll have an insert uh, custom made for whatever mold line we're gonna to have to interface with. Initially with uh, SLS and we'll look at other areas. And then finally the lower right is our firing room one at Kennedy. We're evolving that into a uh, state of the art launch uh, capability. Uh, the crawler transporter, we're in the process of upgrading that. It's, uh, it's not your grandfather's crawler transporter anymore. We're basically increasing the uh, uh, capability of it from 12 million tons to, or 12 million pounds to 18 million pounds. Uh, the mobile launcher upgrade, we're, we're tearing a, a significant amount of structure out of there to enlarge the flame hole, and uh, and so we're we're doing that in process. Again, some more crawler transporter with the roller bearings. We cleaned out the uh, flame trench at. Uh, Launch Complex 39B, and uh, are in the process of installing uh, steel on the sides of those. It's a lessons learned from other launch complexes. Uh, it's easier than the uh, uh, the uh, fondue fire and the and the bricks that we used previously. The recovery test again. That's a photo from the other day, and then the tread uh, capabilities. Exploration Mission One will be in uh, 2018, FY 2018. Uh, we'll launch uh, the first, it, it'll be an uncrewed Orion uh, capability with an uh, uh, interim cryopropulsion stage, a variant of the uh, Delta cryo second stage. We're making some modifications to that. But what we're trying to do here is to, is to demonstrate our capability to navigate in the uh, distant retrograde orbit that we're contemplating employing for the uh, uh, asteroid retrieval mission. This is about a 24-day mission uh, where we'll go out, do a couple of burns, and then come back. Uh, but we're very excited about doing that. We have uh, partners and suppliers spread around the country in 48 states supporting our programs, and, and we're pretty proud of that as well. What I have next is a uh, video that kind of shows you a lot of what I've shown you already, uh, just some uh, some of the folks that are working it, and uh, so we'll see if this works. Okay, it's not going to work. I think we're going to skip this. This is doing exactly what I expected it to do. Nothing. Best laid plans. Anyway, it was to illustrate some of the uh, other capabilities that I've already shown you in the illustrations. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle Gates. Hi. It's uh, great to be able to share with you all a little bit this morning of our status on the asteroid redirect mission. Uh, this is a compelling mission using our early uh, in-space core capabilities for human spaceflight in the CIS Lunar Proving Ground and you'll see provide substantial contributions to our future human endeavors at Mars. I'll try starting out with a video, see if we do any better. This is a depiction of our current concept NASA work. is developing the first ever mission to identify, capture, and redirect a small asteroid or piece of a large asteroid to orbit the moon, then send astronauts to visit it and collect samples in the 2020s. Oh, yeah. 
Using telescopes in space and on Earth, NASA and citizen astronomers are studying the thousands of near-Earth objects around us, including good candidates for the asteroid redirect mission and hazardous ones we want to track. The robotic capture mission will prove a number of the capabilities humans will need to reach Mars in the 2030s, including advanced solar electric propulsion, an efficient way to move larger cargo payloads into deep space. NASA is studying two robotic concepts to capture an asteroid. The first concept would fully enclose a small asteroid in an inflatable mechanism. The second would use robotic arms to retrieve a boulder from the surface of a much larger asteroid. Each concept also provides opportunities to demonstrate techniques to alter the course of large objects in deep space, a capability that could help us defend Earth from impacts in the future. After capturing an asteroid, the robotic spacecraft will move it to a stable orbit around the moon, where it could remain for hundreds of years. The asteroid will be so small that even if it did approach the Earth, it would burn up in the atmosphere and disintegrate before it could reach the surface. In the 2020s, astronauts aboard an Orion spacecraft and Space Launch System rocket will launch toward lunar orbit, gaining a boost in speed from the moon's gravity to rendezvous with the asteroid. The journey will be the farthest humans have ever traveled into deep space. Orion will dock with the robotic spacecraft carrying the asteroid. Astronauts will conduct spacewalks to collect samples of the asteroid that could hold clues to the origins of our solar system and life on Earth. The crew will return home aboard Orion, having ushered in a new era of human spaceflight and scientific research. Groundbreaking work is underway to prepare for these human missions to deep space. This year, NASA will conduct the first uncrewed flight test of Orion, Aboard the International Space Station, NASA and its international partners are learning how humans can live and work in space for long periods. Astronauts on Earth are using underwater environments to test spacesuits, tools, and techniques they'll need to explore an asteroid. The lessons we learn and new technologies we prove through the Asteroid Redirect Mission will put humans one giant leap closer to Mars. So that's kind of our latest public, um, public video for your information. Uh, some of the key aspects of this activity that we see as critical to feeding forward to future longer duration deep space human exploration are A, beginning to move large objects through interplanetary space-like trajectories using high power, long life solar electric propulsion. We see this as critical for enabling pre-emplacement of future assets for longer duration missions such as for Mars. The mission operations of the integrated crewed robotic vehicle stack in the lunar distant retrograde orbit will be the beginning of our deep space orbit stack operations integrated between our human spaceflight and robotic communities. Lean implementation of the robotic vehicle with block upgrade capability will complement our core capability, human spaceflight trans transportation developments that Bill talked about. And the beginning of integrating our science and human spaceflight capabilities on a broad scale. For example, our human spaceflight workforce will be involved in design development of the robotic vehicle, uh, delivering hardware and systems to that vehicle. We're actually gonna be storing some capabilities on that vehicle that will be used in the crewed mission. Uh, integration and test, uh, launch, mission operations, and then culminating in that um, uh, integrated uh, vehicle stack operations in cislunar space. In our exploration strategy, ARM utilizes ongoing capability developments that are each important in their own right to provide a compelling and affordable mission in the mid-2020s using our early core capabilities that also feeds forward to human missions to Mars. Specifically, the technology, systems, and capabilities that you see on this slide, as well as the future slides, we see as enabling for a sustainable, long-duration human exploration capability. Our studies have determined this year that essentially the same uh, robotic flight system can accomplish two key mission options. 
for this mission, each of which would provide substantial asteroid mass in the cislunar vicinity for exploration and sampling by our astronauts on Orion. There's three main segments. Obviously, you saw from the video the identify segment. Folks are busy looking uh, for new asteroids and finding ones for this mission uh, through that activity. Uh, the robotic mission and preparation and implementation of the crewed mission. We've made substantial progress this year in identifying candidate asteroids for this mission. We now have three valid candidates for what we call option A, which is that envelopment and redirection of a small asteroid in its native orbit. And we have three valid candidates for option B, which is the extraction of a large boulder-like mass from an even larger um, asteroid. Excuse me. The Space Technology Mission Directorate has made substantial progress this year in their um, solar electric propulsion technology development work. Their solar array systems phase one contracts um, yielded de design, development, and environmental test of two um, large, lightweight, high-power deployable systems, which are ideal candidates for a number of applications. And their electric propulsion de development work, um, looking at high, at, um, excuse me, high-power ion thrusters, magnetic shielding for long-life operation, and uh, high-voltage um, power processing and power management technologies still ongoing in the Science Mission Direct Space Technology Mission Director at this fiscal year. We've also released and made selections from their broad uh, agency announcement this year. Uh, these are intended to both um, reduce development risk and cost in uh, implementing the asteroid redirect mission, including areas such as the capture system, uh, common rendezvous sensors for the robotic mission and Orion, uh, adapting a commercially available SEP-based spacecraft bus with block upgrade capability, um, partnerships for the robotic mission for secondary payloads, and also partnerships for the crewed mission, including extensibility uh, and future uh, mission uh, use. We also have uh, this fiscal year um, some internal re risk reduction and uh, risk assessment work going on to help inform uh, a mission down select and MCR early next year. So for example, the, um, what you may have originally heard of as a bag concept for option A has evolved into a rigid uh, deployable interface uh, with a pedal-like structure uh, followed by inflatable booms and an inflatable encapsulation mechanism We've got a fifth scale model uh, of this um, that's gonna start testing actually this month. And this is all scheduled to wrap up uh, by the end of September in preparation for our down select uh, mission concept review and folding in the BAA inputs, uh, which the interims are due in October. For option B, there's four key risk areas that are um, being assessed and some um, testing done to look at uh, actually doing um, a risk reduction and assessment for uh, mission concept review. We're happy to talk to you in more detail about these. There's um, areas including proximity operations, stability of the spacecraft uh, during the capture event itself, um, uh, loads and vibrations, impacts on the spacecraft, and uh, relative navigation. Dan Masnick, who is here in the audience, I, I know has a paper later today on these aspects, and I'm sure we'd be happy to take your questions. The crewed mission, as Bill had described earlier, is um, actually a very compelling 26 to 28 day mission on Orion with a um, nine day outbound, uh, 11 day return, and five days in the lunar distant retrograde orbit. Our folks have looked at contingency scenarios uh, for critical burns, as well as um, launch windows, uh, calm coverage, and a variety of other uh, mission design considerations uh, during this pre-formulation phase. 
We've also been employing a mission kit concept to uh, keep the mission affordable, where we have the specific mission kit capabilities in addition to our core capabilities for crew transportation that allows us to keep overall costs down and also uh, enable uh, future exploration missions through these kits. And examples include systems for in-space EVA, communication, uh, repressurization, and sample um, extraction and containment um, kits. Uh, the advanced in-space EVA capabilities are being developed in uh, cooperation with our advanced exploration systems and ISS. Uh, activities and um, have been actually tested over the last year in the ne neutral buoyancy lab, both for feasibility as well as um, um, techniques for egress from Orion, translation over the SEP spacecraft, rudimentary sampling extraction, translation back over the SEP based spacecraft, ingress into Orion. Uh, and so right here you see just a couple of uh, uh, slides um, excuse me, images of uh, current status showing the uh, primary life support system, which is portable, as well as the um, suit and beginning integration of those systems in the lab. Uh, and finally, the, this slide shows some examples of what we see as key systems uh, on the spacecraft themselves, which feed forward to future exploration, including Mars, including the um, high power, long duration, uh, advanced solar electric propulsion systems, uh, common systems such as the rendezvous sensors, international docking system, uh, in-space EVA, and then um, the integrated stack showed here um, clearly the uh, in attitude control, solar thermal um, management, um, and operation of this stack in the distant retrograde orbit will be significant learning. For us. So we're really looking forward to it, and thank you. So you've heard a lot of uh, different pieces and parts of advancement of capabilities that are going on in human spaceflight and with our colleagues in science and, um, and technology. And I'm going to um, take us through. Uh, a little bit of how that comes together into an integrated strategy uh, from going from Earth reliant to being ready for Mars or Earth independent. Um, one of the key things we, we, we've been iterating on is what we call our strategic principles. And what you're seeing up here is our six strategic principles that we use to guide our overall strategy for human spaceflight and exploration. Um, the first one being um, near term executable within the buying power we have today, but the reality of that we're going to need budget commensurate uh, with an economic growth in the future. Um, that's one of the key pieces of living within the, within the fiscal reality we have um, in the near term and then being able to execute over a long term. Uh, we also want to be able to apply high technology readiness level uh, activities like you he just heard from Michelle. Um, but also be continuing to make investments in our long-term technology uh, growths and capabilities as we need there. This is the reflection of a, a real need for a balanced portfolio that we have. The other piece is, what is that near-term mission opportunity? So where do we have a constant cadence of missions that keep uh, all of us engaged, the public engaged, and our stakeholder engaged? And how do we have that cadence on a regular basis um, with robotic missions and human missions working together in keeping that compelling uh, exploration goal we have. Um, the next piece is U.S. commercial industry um, and commercial expansion. You heard from Sam, how do we expand the low Earth orbit marketplace to move from a government activity to a commercial market activity? And where do those commercial market activities expand even further? And let's, from the very beginning, consider commercial activities in our exploration strategy instead of backing into them um, at the end of our planning process. So we're, we're involving the commercial sector much more upfront uh, in our planning processes. The other piece is multi-use infrastructure. And this could be literally the multi-use infrastructure reusing of the same physical hardware, or it could be uh, the, doing the NRE, the non-recurring expense, on an item once and not having to do it again and be able to look about how do you reuse that. Um, and then the last piece on here is international. Obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to build on our strong partnerships and build even more partnerships um, to uh, go execute this strategy. Internally, we are, we are 
kind of lassoing all the various mission directorates within NASA and actually doing a more integrated plan of working uh, Whenever science sends a mission like Mars 2020, how do we advance human spaceflight capabilities at the same time? And making those decisions as an integrated set uh, between um, all the mission directorates we have. The other piece is then, how does this then translate into our planning process? So many of you guys are aware of our design reference architectures and de design reference missions of the past that we did for Mars. They were, they were quite monolithic and required a whole series of exact missions in a very precise amount of time and, and relatively short period of time to build out a capability. What we're, the, what we're embarking on now is actually changing the way we do architecture planning and what we call that is our Evolvable Mars campaign. So how does this guiding philosophy work when you look at, um, uh, look at this different than we have done in, with uh, the Mars planning in the past? So Evolvable Mars campaign takes into account current capabilities and current investments, be it SLS, uh, ISS, Orion, the asteroid redirect mission, that we're looking at an exploration augmentation module as our initial capabilities, um, and cislunar, um, the technology investment portfolios that we have and the science missions and science uh, investments that are going on in the science mission directorate. And what we are gonna end up doing is developing um, uh, our overall, how do we go from this Earth reliant to uh, Mars ready or Earth independent phase, and how do we maximize the use in this cis lunar ground in order to advance those capabilities? And, and not just advance the capabilities to fly a mission, but are we actually building the infrastructure, and how are we going to build the infrastructure that uh, then at the time that we say, okay, we've checked it out, we're ready to go, and, and then we go to Mars and go execute our first Mars mission. Um, obviously, we've been doing a lot of this Mars planning and our Mars uh, campaign with that same guiding principle related to budget, both in escalation and peaks in the budget reality. We won't see significant peaks, but rather um, a, a gradual economic growth uh, increase over time. Um, Pre-positioning. Um, so we've been analyzing different scenarios of pre-positioning cargo on the, in the Mars orbit, even on, on the Mars surface, and what are the different sequences that we would do that pre-positioning. Um, at the very bottom here is, is one of the, the key aspects of this, though, is we are not developing the single plan from here to the surface of Mars, but rather uh, analyzing and understanding all the potential options with getting a very solid near-term execution plan while then exploring how those near-term plans then affect and follow through all the way to the surface of Mars. There's gonna be a lot of changes, both technology advancements and capability advancements, along with policy changes between now and the surface. So how do we maximize our near-term execution and get the reality of those missions going while then understanding the options and the effects of those decisions on our pathway all the way to Mars? So, this is a chart that we've used a couple times, and one of the things is to, to illustrate is there are multiple um, steps on our way and path to Mars. The proving ground period in cislunar space gives us a unique opportunity to advance capabilities and test them before we then uh, take those same systems uh, to Mars. So as part of the Evolvable Mars campaign, we're doing some critical uh, trade analysis related to solar electric propulsion and how do we revisit, revisit that capability as a cargo pre-emplacement capability or maneuvering large objects around, including the stacks of, and the habitats and such that we'll need for Mars missions. We're also revisiting a lot of our trades for ISRU. In the past, uh, Mars, we've always known that we would want to do the oxidizer for our return trip home, but are there other um, paths for ISRU along the way that we, we left off previous analysis? So we're revisiting the, the role of ISRU in our strategy, um, be it from asteroid material or lunar material that would then enable our architecture for Mars. And you can see that there's a bunch of other trade areas that I won't go into today, but um, all of these are then enabling our, how do we go to the Mars vicinity and return to Mars? Um, so we're looking at split versus monolithic uh, architectures. DRA 5.0 was more of a monolithic, uh, single habitat, single stack going to Mars. Now we're looking at split mission scenarios where we do pre-emplacement um, for cargo and, and, and some of our landing and ascent capabilities we go, that we have there. We are looking at other um, waypoints along the way in that Phobos and Deimos could uh, serve as a very good stopping point or test point or pre-emplacement point of some of these habitats and lander capabilities uh, on our way to the surface of Mars. And how does Phobos and Deimos potentially help us in advancing some of those capabilities? So 
one of the, this is, there's a struggle with this kind of strategy though, that um, folks, is, it's hard to communicate this kind of capability advancement kind of approach. And what, what you're seeing here on this chart is at the top, we, we need to fundamentally advance a whole host of system capabilities. But at the bottom of this chart is then we need to execute a series of sequential missions in a logical way that then can adjust over time as, a, as we find out how those capabilities actually perform in the environments that they're going into. Um, so this, there's a balance of mission execution and detailed planning of what the sequence of missions are, coupled with uh, the, the overall capability framework that we're trying to advance uh, our ability to get to the surface of Mars. And I'll, I'll give you one example. So, one of the things we're looking at with the Evolvable Mars campaign is Mars split mission. I kind of referred to that before. And what you're looking at here is pre-emplacement um, using CEP um, to deploy some of our initial destination systems and the return vehicles on the surface of Mars. Using that CEP system allows us to actually deliver those in an earlier state, know that they're working, and knowing that they're operating on the surface. Um, in addition, we could use that same kind of pre-deployment strategy if we wanted to pre-deploy to Phobos as well. You, f you follow that by the actual crude segment. So how do you then stage your crude segment in a more rapid transport uh, way using more conventional uh, propell propellant systems to do the crude transfer and then rendezvous up with the habitats and the surface systems that are already placed there? And the last aspect of this is return. Um, going back to the multi-use infrastructure is how do we reuse those assets that we just took to the, to the Mars vicinity and instead of throwing them away, park them back into some kind of cis-lunar orbit and, and use that, uh, that, that, that location as more of a maintenance depot and be able to retrofit that, allow the crew to come back direct to Earth and then allow the next crew to come up and start uh, outfitting that vehicle to go on a round trip to Mars again. So these are the kinds of different analysis that we're doing um, for our overall architecture. And the, that analysis helps us then to make good technology investments and capability investments along the way. Things like how do we size the SEP systems to be the proper way? What does our EVA suits need to do both in space and on the surface? And can we get commonality of the primary life support system as an example on the EVA? Um, in our advanced exploration system group, we are advancing a lot of the technologies that you see in deep space habitation, landing systems, hazard avoidance, the crew mobility stuff that you see with the EVA uh, that Michelle was talking about, and also a number of pre robotic precursors, both within our own directorate, but also in partnership with our science mission directorate colleagues and space technology mission directorate folks. Um, it, one example is Morpheus. It's our uh, vertical test bed. But its primary purpose was to test advanced uh, hazard avoidance and landing uh, technology that can be utilized on nearly any planetary body in order to get our landing ellipses much, much uh, tighter tolerance so that we, get, we know when we do this pre-emplacement of cargo and pre-emplacement of habitats that we can actually land them in a location that they're all accessible to each other. So we've been advancing that through our, our test bed and you just saw a recent uh, uh, completion of our test sequence for this year, culminating in the free flight at the end of the year. But at the same time, we're advancing the capability that we need for landing on planetary surfaces, but we also know there's a budding uh, commercial sector that's coming along as well and that has a commercial interest of returning to the moon. So how do we leverage that same capability that we're doing for our own NASA missions and then share that with the commercial sector to advance their capabilities? And we're doing this through a, an effort called Lunar Catalyst, which is no exchange of funds, but we are uh, sharing our in-house people, expertise, facilities, and even uh, loaning a government hardware to accelerate their capabilities for commercial uh, landing returns to the moon all again on the same technology and capability basis that we need for uh, landing on planetary surfaces as well. Again, there's other avenues that we partner with the commercial sector. We're advancing soft good habitat technology on, on the board the space station with our partners with Bigelow. Um, the key aspect that we're testing here is actually thermal performance, the structure of actually inflation, and then the overall radiation uh, performance in low Earth orbit. Soft good structures could allow us to have larger volumes uh, in transit, but very importantly, uh, soft good structures are, are, are trade extremely well when you get to a surface system type element on the surface of Mars. But we, have, we had critical needs to understand the thermal and radiation environment. They have that same need for their own commercial purposes, so we work together to do that demonstration, utilizing the station platform to advance that. 
With that, um, with our exploration planning, there's been a whole host of RFPs, RFIs, BAAs that are out there. And we're utilizing these to ask a lot of questions up front. You, you've seen a lot more of these in the mo recent history than NASA's previously done. And they are actually all closely coordinated. Everything from our, our in kind of operational status, commercial crew and, re and cargo resupply efforts to CASIS and advancing the utilization in the commercial market in low Earth orbit, expanding into what um, Sam hit on earlier, the evolving the ISS RFI. How do we evolve that into a commercially viable facility, both in low Earth orbit, but then learn from that for exploration? Our catalyst efforts, uh, Michelle mentioned the BAA that we had related to the asteroid redirect mission, which had two key elements in it related to commercialization and extensibility, both on robotics and humans. To another, we had an effort called the Collaborations for Commercial Space Capabilities, which is another series of partnerships where we're going to be advancing uh, capabilities in, in concert with the private sector, much like Catalyst, but in other system discipline areas. Um, I think that's it. So one of the things I wanted to leave is, is a, a real concrete example with Mars 2020. And I'll, and I'll use this to transition over to Jeff. And it, this is a, a real sign of the, of the cooperation between the mission directorates in that we have two of the instruments on there that are actually supporting our human exploration goals in MOXIE and META. Uh, both of these are doing advancements, and you'll hear more about these at the other sessions. But th these are critical advancements for ISRU and surface weather characterization. Uh, these are important for the science community, but also very important for our exploration knowledge before we send humans. The one piece that's not listed here is also a medley, a reflight of our upper atmosphere and uh, re-entry characterizations that will also be flying on Mars 2020. So with that, we have a suite of three contributions that are highly contributing to our strategic knowledge gaps for human spaceflight, flying on a primary science mission director at mission. And with that, that's a great example, and to turn over to Jeff to talk about some of the other aspects in their space technology mission director and the efforts that they're going as well. Well, good morning. I'm uh, really pleased to have the opportunity to be here. If you look in your uh, program, I wasn't supposed to be here at this session, but I'm pinch hitting for my boss who had a uh, issue that he needed to take care of, so he uh, sent me here to, to uh, be on this august panel. I feel like the uh, answer to the old Sesame Street game, can you guess which thing is not like the other? Uh, bec because I'm the space technology mission director at Representative amidst a group of representatives from our human exploration and operations mission director. But as Jason pointed out, we're, we're all pursuing the same bold missions and visions. We're all pursuing the development of the capabilities to accomplish those. And so in space technology, we have a wide range of activities dedicated to developing the capabilities, providing the new knowledge, developing the new technologies needed to carry out the missions and the visions that, that you've seen represented here today. So I just wanted to highlight a few things um, we've been sitting here a while, and I won't take too much time, but um, if you, oh, I think I can do this, right? Let's see, green must be go, there. So, um, as I mentioned, and as you've seen in the presentations that preceded me, uh, a lot of technologies are going to be needed to move from this Earth-reliant uh, space exploration to the through the proving ground and two deep space operations. I think Sam showed two really compelling slides, one which showed all the infrastructure and support that we have when we have human exploration near Earth, uh, the ability to get back and forth quickly, the ability to get supplies back and forth quickly to resupply, to refresh the crew. And then the next slide showed, well, if we're going to be in, in deep space, we don't have any of that. We have long trip times. We need to take everything we need for the oper all of the operations while we're there. And so there's a wide range of technologies needed to develop the capability to move from the first realm of operations that, that Sam highlighted to the second. And so this slide shows a, a, a representation of the technology path to Mars. You can see on the left there, the solar electric propulsion, a couple of concepts 
for that that we've been pursuing. Michelle highlighted that space technology has been working on the high power arrays, the higher power electric propulsion thrusters, and the power processing electronics all needed to develop a high power solar electric propulsion module that could be used for the asteroid redirect mission as well as um, cargo transport to Mars. Uh, Jason showed staging the cargo and getting it in place. And you can see that in this slide here on the lower right, all the infrastructure that you'd need to operate on Mars, some concepts there for in situ resource utilization, basically setting up a chemical engineering plant on Mars to provide some of the resources you need. Jason mentioned the uh, demonstration that we've just selected for the Mars rover where we're going to generate oxygen on Mars and show the capability to do that by a means that can be scaled up to uh, human exploration support to produce oxygen for breathing, oxygen possibly to combine with other resources to, to make water, oxygen that could be used as a propellant. So we like to think of it in terms of, you know, to, to operate in deep, spar deep space and particularly to get to Mars, you got to get there, you got to land there, you got to live there, and you will want to leave there probably. So you need to return. And so this kind of depicts the, the realm of technologies needed to do those things. One of the things that we've uh, had a very recent success uh, test flight in space technology is in this realm of landing there. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, about one one hundredth of the density of the Earth atmosphere, uh, but you can use it to help decelerate. And so we've been developing technologies to land larger payloads on Mars and to access more of the Martian surface by being able to land at higher altitudes. One of the projects that we've been pursuing to do that is called Low Density Supersonic Decelerator. And so the, on, when we go to the next slide, you'll see a video that shows uh, the re, some a little compilation of uh, highlights from the recent test flight we had right at the end of July. So this is just a couple weeks old. And um, right at the end of June, sorry. So it's, uh, it's about four weeks, five weeks old. Uh, so very fresh results. We got some fabulous data. What we were trying to accomplish in the test was this was the first flight of multiple planned flights. We had to develop a whole infrastructure to test these technologies. We really would have been happy if we had just successfully shaken out the test infrastructure, got the test vehicle to the right test conditions. But in addition to that, we were able to de deploy the supersonic decelerator, deploy a supersonic parachute and, and learn quite a lot about those. So when I flip to the next side, you'll see the video. I'll set it up just briefly. First thing you'll see is the little flying saucer test vehicle hanging right in the center. And on the left, you'll start to see about the biggest high altitude balloon you can get starting to be inflated. It takes the test vehicle up to 120,000 feet, drops it. The test vehicle has a Star 48 solid rocket motor with about 4,500 pounds of energetic propellant. So the rocket lights, it uh, accelerates the vehicle to above Mach 4 and takes it to 180,000 feet where we can begin the test. We deploy the supersonic decelerator. You'll see the ring around the vehicle um, in the video. And then you'll see the parachute deploy. Parachute didn't work quite like we'd hoped. But we've learned a lot. We had tremendous data collection capability. And so we learned a lot about how supersonic parachutes inflate. And even the experts in the agency are going back to old flights, old test data, and understanding, oh, this is how those things work. And so it's really valuable test results. So I'll just, I'll just try to flip to that here. So this should just roll. You can see on the left the balloon inflating. and. And you'll see, you see the test vehicle hanging there in the center, and you'll see it released from that test fixture and um, start to fly on the balloon. And it takes a couple hours to float up to the altitude. We had to wait for the winds to be just right. This is a test done at the Pacific Missile Range Facility off uh, Kauai in, 
in the Hawaiian Islands, and you didn't want the Star 48 motor with its energetic propellant to blow back over land just in case uh, something might happen to the vehicle and the and the uh, it falls from the balloon. And so we had to wait till the winds were blowing nicely offshore to get to the vehicle into the very large range of ocean where you can conduct these tests. So we spin up the vehicle and light the solid rocket. You can see the, the exhaust from the nozzle there. Now we've de-spinned and you can see the ring around the vehicle. That's the inflatable decelerator. We deployed that a little above a Mach uh, 4. And then at Mach 2, we deployed the supersonic parachute. You'll see that in just a moment. First, you'll see a uh, balut come out to provide some stabilization, and then it, it pulls the parachute out. So you'll see a yellow thing. There's that. That worked fabulously. Biggest supersonic uh, balut ever flown. And then parachute comes out and immediately shreds, unfortunately. <laughs> um, there's a there's a still picture of it. And then what you'll see here is a couple of still photos. There's the balut, we retrieved that. And then we ultimately retrieved the test vehicle out of the ocean. So uh, we've had, as I mentioned, the expert uh, parachute graybeards from, from the agency and, and otherwise come in uh, and, and look at these test results and really understand how supersonic parachutes inflate. So we have two more test flights coming up next year and uh, we'll be exploring other uh, boundaries of the, of the uh, flight regime that, that we might want to deploy these devices in. We'll be looking at um, some uh, fixes for the issues with the parachute. We were using actually a new parachute design here. We may drop back to a previous design. But um, this was a really rousing test success, notwithstanding the parachute um, uh, issue that we had. A lot of other systems on the vehicle worked fabulously, including the supersonic decelerator, which is a centerpiece technology. So that those technologies could allow you to land twice the amount of payload on Mars that uh, we landed just about two years ago, almost exactly, with the Mars uh, Curiosity rover, which is about the size of my daughter's uh, CRV. Uh, Honda CRV car. Jason already showed this slide, the uh, 2020 rover, highlighting the uh, instruments that are on the rover. In particular, we're very excited to be partnering with Human Exploration, uh, Jason's team, and, and others in HEO on the um, MOXIE experiment, the Mars Oxygen Institute Resource Utilization Experiment. Here's a little uh, more detail on that one uh, basically shows what it is, how it works, what it's trying to do, the major objectives of the demo. So you can see in the lower left the demonstration package. It's relatively small, about 20 pounds, uh, fits in the space of about one and a half uh, standard men's shoe boxes. So it's a fairly small scale demo, but it'll demonstrate the capability to produce high purity oxygen by sucking in the at Mars atmosphere, filtering it, pumping out the residuals, and using solid oxide electrolysis. So you could just build up the solid oxide electrolysis unit to a scale to support larger operations on Mars. So this is a, it will be the first demonstration of uh, in situ resource production on uh, a, a planetary body like this, so we're very excited about this. This selection was just made about a week ago, and so uh, really fresh news and, and a lot of excitement around this. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to just highlight a couple things that space technology is doing. There's a, a panel session at 2 o'clock later today that Chris Moore from uh, Jason's organization has organized. Um, I'll give some more details on what space technology has been doing, and uh, I think Jason will have more details on what his program has been doing too, so I hope you'll tune in for that. And uh, with that, I'll pass the baton back to Greg. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jeff. We're, uh, 
uh, kind of coming close to the end of our time, but if, if there's uh, any questions, we'd be glad to, to take them. There are a couple of microphones here at the, uh, uh, on the aisles. If uh, we can answer anything for you, we'll do that. Sure, go ahead. Um, hi, I have one uh, or two, actually. George Torres with Astoria Press. And great presentations. It's encouraging to see it all. But I want to back up to Sam and then maybe follow up for, from you, Greg, or, or others on, on uh, mission duration. So on the one-year mission starting next year, I think back to the Soviets, and they had a 13-month mission pre-ISS. So the question is, what did we learn from that? And then beyond the 12-month, are there plans plan, you know, set in to go to 18, 24-month, et cetera, until we you know, go from there, on ISS or post-ISS? All right. Sam? So um, I answer the, uh, uh, the uh, second question first. What our plans are is that uh, we are tentatively looking at follow-on missions to the 12-month, the one-year mission, and the same level of one-year one year, uh, uh, duration. We'll see how this one goes, and then we'll make a determination of you know, you know, how we want to proceed to the next level. As far as the, uh, the Russian program and the Soviet program, uh, there wasn't a lot of data collected. Uh, there's some, but it's not, uh, you know, back in those days, there wasn't a lot of uh, the modern techniques for monitoring health and uh, doing the, all the characterizations that we do today. So we have a little bit of data, but it really doesn't, uh, it's, it's not, doesn't plot well on a curve. I understand. All right. Thanks. And then, but somehow we got to get to 24 months or, or 30. Yeah, yes. so, 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 so we'll take what we learned for this, for this first one, and then we'll, we'll go from there. OK. Uh, press one more time. Do we see that during ISS in the next 10 years, or is it post-ISS? Perhaps for Greg. It as far as, what was the question? Sorry. How is do it, we get to 24 months, 30 months, oh, we could, six months? Uh, it's possible to do that on station, I would imagine. Uh, we may also do that uh, in preparation for uh, going to Mars. So uh, you don't have to go to the whole, you know, two-year or three-year mission. Just like when you run a marathon or train for a marathon, you don't have to run the whole marathon to train. So uh, we'll be looking at that uh, after this. Um. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, so we have a couple minutes left. Any, of the, any others we can do now? If not, we're gonna be uh, almost, I think, throughout the day, wandering uh, among various sessions. So please feel free to uh, pose any questions you want to us as individuals or collectively as you find us. We'll be glad to, uh, to speak to those. Uh, two things I ask you to uh, watch for as we roll through the rest of the calendar year. First, we didn't, one of the things we did not talk about here is the commercial crew program and how that's gonna be essential to, uh, for a variety of goals, including station operations as, as well as uh, uh, as commercial ventures in, uh, in LEO in the future. Uh, in the August-September timeframe, we'll be uh, making a selection uh, as a result of the commercial crew competition, so be watching for that. Uh, and then, of course, in, uh, in early December, the exploration uh, flight test one, where we will, uh, uh, that Bill referred to earlier, uh, be on the lookout for that. That's gonna be tremendously exciting and give us lots of uh, data we need to uh, complete the Orion development program. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you.